but we have to be careful. Um, there's this thing what we call peak oil, um, which is going to be probably one of the biggest discussions we're going to be having in the near future around this country and around the world. If you look at oil and gas production uh, since 1930 and into the future, if you want to look at it, whoops, let me get a different color here. Okay, we're right about there. Here's 2011. If you notice worldwide production of oil and gas starting, it's actually peaked. Go back to around 2005 is at its peak, and now is declining worldwide. That means we are pulling less oil and gas from the ground today than we were a few years ago. That trend, according to scientists, is going to continue to drop less and less and less. So we're going to have less and less available oil and gas. And for you people who are taking economics, you know that as the supply becomes tight, the demand and the demand remains high, the price is going to go up. And so we're, we don't have anything that we would like to call cheap oil anymore. Um, so we pretty much hit the peak worldwide of oil production. Unless we discover some kind of vast new oil supply, we're going to be declining tremendously over the next uh, 30 years, and we don't have anything to replace it right now. So this whole concept of peak oil means that we need to start thinking about alternatives. We will have no choice. Now, some people claim that that's a myth because there's a lot of oil still in this earth. And this, this chart, I think, exaggerates that, but I, I, I put it in here for a point. This is what we know, what we call proven reserves, that we know exist. But this much is still in the ground that we can recover. All right? And this amount down here all right, is what we could pull out of shale. The problem is, and this one at the bottom, I don't think is, that's just a guess from this particular organization. I don't think that's a very good one to use. But this we could use here. These two possible sources. The only problem is, if you look at it, this one says technically recoverable, and this one is oil shale. If we could, and if that oil is in existence today, it is going to cost huge amounts of money to pull that from the ground. So the price of oil has nowhere to go but up, either by lack of supply, or if we do find more, it's going to be more expensive to get. And the second thing is, especially with this oil shale, as you're going to find out, the environmental consequences of oil shale is just outstanding compared to um, even just drilling for regular oil. So we're looking at huge economic considerations here and also huge environmental considerations. So even if we do decide to go after all that oil, we're going to have a real fight on our hands and some real environmental consequences we're going to be dealing with. But our society depends on oil. Without it, uh, we're in trouble. So it says one thing is clear, the era of easy oil is over. What we all do next will determine how well we meet the energy needs of the entire world in this century and beyond. And that was a quote by the chairman of Chevron Oil Company. Now this slide was for all of you great music lovers. I just found this to be absolutely fascinating. It has absolutely nothing to do with anything that you need to know for your test. But if you look at oil production in the United States in the lower 48, um, you will see here's the trend of oil production. And then if you look at Rolling Stone's 500 all-time greatest songs ever produced, rock and roll songs, they follow the exact same pattern. So for some reason, oil and rock music quality somehow coexist and correlate with each other. Take it for what it's worth, but that's as much as you get out of that. Okay, how much, how much are we actually producing in the United States? Oil production um, has dropped. We seem to have hit our peak much earlier than the world. So if you make a smooth curve here, you're talking peaking back in the early 1970s or around mid-1970s. And ever since then, our peak, we've gone past our peak. We've gone down until just recently, over the past couple of years, our oil production has actually gone up a little bit because we've discovered a few new places of oil. Technology has gotten a little bit better, and we can recover some of that shale oil a little bit better. Um, and so our oil production has actually gone up in the United States recently, which 
if you talk to most people in our country, they don't see that. They don't realize that our oil production has actually gone up recently. All right, who has the oil in the world? All right, this tells you a lot about our world uh, politics. Um, if you look at see who has the most, who's producing the most oil, you're talking Saudi Arabia. All right, they have they're producing the most oil. Second is Russia. We are third. Iran is fourth. And if you look at just the top four right there, okay, um, what you're looking at are the economic, or I'm sorry, the um, the social consequences of who we just try to deal with. Russia has not been cooperative with us. We don't get their oil at all. Iran has not been cooperative with us. So our best friends over there are Saudi Arabia. Their total production is huge. They also have the largest reserves still left in the ground. All right, But um, this shows you some of the reasons why um, we have our policies towards the Middle East because we're trying to protect our interest, trying to keep Saudi Arabia stable where we can continue to get their oil. But some of the things you don't realize here, Mexico is a large producer of oil, and so is Canada. So when we talk about oil imports, how much the United States gets from different countries, you'll be shocked to find out who we actually get our oil from. And when we talk about the Middle East, you're talking about this organization called OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. They're the countries that have the largest reserves of oil still in the ground. They are the ones, unfortunately, that pretty much set the worldwide price for oil. So their power is declining. It has declined a little bit recently. But they are still the most powerful organization in the world because they set the price for oil, which then sets our price at the pump when we pay for gasoline. So when we talk about prices of gasoline at the pump and we talk about how you know what we could do to change those prices, there's actually very little our politicians can do because we are dependent on OPEC and what they do with their pricing. So um, I think we have to understand that this is not a United States market. This is a worldwide market. Um, any oil that we produce in the United States does not stay in the United States. The oil produced in the United States can go anywhere in the world. In fact, most of the newly discovered oil in the United States that we're producing is actually being exported. We're exporting our oil to other countries. But at the same time, we then import oil from other countries. And Here's the people we import from. If you look at our number one country that we import from, it's Canada. Number two is Mexico, and then Saudi Arabia and the Middle East. And then you look at some of these. You got Africa here, South America here, and then we get some from Iraq. And you got Africa, South America, Africa, South America, Central America, and then you go Middle East. We don't get that much oil from the Middle East. Not as people seem to think that when we import oil, we get it all from the Middle East. That's not true. Most of it comes from Canada. So keep that in mind as we uh, talk about imports of oil. Whoops. Here is um, our projections for importing oil in the future. If you look at what we have now, um, early in 2005, we were importing about 60% of all the oil. This is what we actually produce, our domestic supply. Remember, it's gone up a little bit recently. Here's what we consume. Okay, It has gone down recently. All right, That means our gap between what we make and what we need has gone down a little bit. So we're importing about 49% of our oil, less than half. And in the future, it's going to be about a third. So oil imports will be going down in the United States. And I, I see that trend continuing. I don't see anything that's going to stop that trend from happening. All right. One of the problems with producing oil are accidents. And this is the famous one that occurred in 2010. This is the BP oil spill. BP for British Petroleum, um, a company uh, that was producing oil in the Gulf of Mexico in this particular case. Okay, this is the oil rig in which the accident occurred. It it caught on fire. It exploded. Eleven people died. Okay, um, but more importantly, below at the bottom of the ocean where it was drilling, um, one of if you want to think about it as gas pipes broke as they were pulling crude oil out, and oil spilled into the ocean. 
Um, it, again, this is crude oil. So you can see in the top left some of the pictures of what crude oil would actually look like. Here is a satellite view of the oil working its way through the Gulf of Mexico after the BP oil spill in 2010. Here's one of the ways we clean up or try to prevent the uh, oil from um, spreading. These are called booms. All right, these are oil cleanup, or I guess we'll call them oil cleanup techniques. All right, one process or one is called a boom, which is really a floating barrier. It's made basically of styrofoam with a with a plastic coating on it that floats on the surface, and then underneath it is a curtain that hangs down with weights, and that curtain stays underwater. And so what happens is, since oil is lighter than water, it's going to move against the water, hit the boom, and the boom will hold it in place and stop it from spreading. That's one way that we would clean up an oil spill, but there are other ways as well. The second uh, that we use a lot with the BP oil spill is being sprayed out of this airplane. It's called a dispersant. This is number two. All right, a dispersant is a chemical that when you spray it on oil, the oil breaks apart into small particles, breaks up, and then hopefully gets uh, swallowed up by the uh, water and gets put in the water column. Um, and, and it doesn't get rid of the oil. It doesn't do anything to really technically clean it up, but rather it just kind of breaks it apart and makes it into small pieces, which isn't as noticeable. Some people are see this as a mistake to put dispersants on because it takes an oil spill, puts it underwater where, where the... Um, booms and these boats that pick up the oil called skimmers they can't get it um, you know so it's it's difficult to decide if, if dispersant is a good idea or a bad idea um, right now it's one of the ways that we reduce the uh, effects of oil spills by breaking up the oil um, and here is the actual BP oil spill um, the uh, rig itself was called the deep water horizon so if you ever see that word that's what it means it's called the deep water horizon and that deep water horizon uh, was the oil rig right here. Okay, um, that's what an oil rig looks like. All right, here is, I love the picture because here it is laying on the bottom of the ocean, the actual rig itself. And what happened was um, this part where the oil was being pulled up out of the ground, at this point it broke, and here's the oil plume coming out of the broken pipe. Unfortunately, it was 5,000 feet underwater. That's like a mile down, very difficult to get to, very difficult to fix. And the only way they actually stop the oil from coming out is by setting up a new rig way over here, drilling down into the rock layer all the way over to this pipe, which is pulling the oil up and pulling the oil into the new oil rig up here. That then cut off the flow to this, and then they sealed this up and blocked it up. And that's what stopped this flow from coming out. All right, this was the deep water horizon or the BP oil spill that occurred in the Gulf in 2010. Whoops. Uh, here's the uh, oil slick. Everything that's darker color there is um, oil. Along the Louisiana coast, you'll see booms. Here are the booms themselves set up to kind of hold the oil, prevent it from moving. Okay, and the only actual water place is right there. That's the only part that's actually water because you have a boat right here that's picking up the oil. That's your little skimmer that actually picks up the oil. So you can see the devastation that would be causing on the shoreline. Okay, and the third thing is actual physical cleanup. Okay, where you get people going out to the beaches, as you see here, and actually physically picking up the globs of oil or cleaning up the beaches with bulldozers and stuff like that. Very labor intensive, almost sad um, way of uh, cleaning up oil. This is the final straw because the oil has reached the uh, land. Okay, and there's a boat through the oil. That's the deep water horizon burning as the boats come to help. And you can see the oil just all over the ocean there. But we sit there and we worry about the Exxon Valdez oil spill or the BP oil spill, but in reality, we dump on purpose 85% of all the oil spilled in the world, or from the United States, I should say, 85% of the oil spilled is actually poured by people, either purposely down the drain or cars leaking, all right, 
So the oil that's in our waterways, 85% of it comes from individuals dumping oil or having it spill from our automobiles and things like that. So don't think of these disasters as the only oil spills in America. Okay? And the last thing to talk about, getting desperate. We want oil so bad because our oil production is going down. We are now squeezing the oil out of the oil shale. We got natural gas from shale. Now we're trying to get the oil from shale and sand tar. I'm sorry, tar sand. Um, this is just a incredibly environmentally destructive process by which um, companies will go into an area where the tar sands are located, which is sand and oil mixed and tar, you know, that crude oil mix. So they have to separate it out. But what they have to do is go in and scoop it out. So they go in, they build roads, and they just literally take away the land. And what you have left is all of this tar sand. Okay, Huge destructive process. You can see to the right, you can see the tar sands and, and, and the, the uh, quarry type thing is going after the shale oil, trying to break up the rock separate the sand and the uh, shale from the tar itself. Hugely destructive. And not only that, but just the separation process is energy intensive. You put out huge amounts of carbon dioxide and um, you just end up with probably the dirtiest, most polluting form of oil you can imagine. And where is that oil? It is actually, as you see, in southwestern uh, Canada. And to get it here, basically, the Canadians have lobbied and got a lot of people on their side to build a pipeline from the tar sands, this hugely destructive, environmentally devastating process, right through the central part of our country, down to the refineries in the Gulf of Mexico, where we then can refine it and distribute it. So far, the pipeline has been stopped um, as at this time, as I'm making this particular lecture. But in the future, we have no idea how long they're going to uh, prevent this pipeline from being uh, put in. And so what we're doing is we're just supplementing our oil supply with the tar sands from Canada. Um, you decide if that's a good idea or not. And with that, I'm going to let you think about this for a little bit. And we'll come back and discuss it more in class. Thank you.